Greetings, friends, and welcome back to the podcast of Jewish Ideas, a Torah in Motion podcast. I'm JJ Kimchi. The astronomical theories of Nicholas Copernicus in the 16th century precipitated one of the most important scientific revolutions of all time. The extraordinary idea that the Earth is not at the center of the universe, but rather orbits the sun, was an astonishing revelation, whose astronomical, philosophical, and religious consequences are still being debated to this day. In this episode, we will explore the long and fascinating history of the Jewish reaction to Copernicus and the manner in which Jewish intellectuals have accepted or rejected the heliocentric model from the 16th century all the way to our own time. Joining us to discuss the history of the Jewish reception of Copernicus's ideas is the man who literally wrote the book on the subject, a splendid book titled New Heavens and a New Earth, The Jewish Reception of Copernican Thought from the Oxford University Press 2013. The man in question is Dr. Jeremy Brown, one of the finest gentleman scholars who has made significant contributions to the field of Jewish studies. A physician by training and practice, Dr. Brown worked by day as a professor of emergency medicine at George Washington University School of Medicine and currently serves as the director of the Office of Emergency Care Research at the National Institute of Health. He moonlights as a researcher and author having produced several fine works on popular science and Jewish intellectual history. He has also written prolifically about science and medicine in the Talmud at his blog, Talmudology. We are delighted to welcome Dr. Brown to the podcast of Jewish Ideas today. Welcome, sir. Thank you, JJ, for that terrific introduction. You are too kind. Excellent. Um, we shall see how kind I am throughout the rest of the uh, the rest of the conversation. Okay. Um, so um, thank you for for talking to us about this. I'm very excited. This is a fascinating uh, romp through Jewish intellectual history from the 16th century till today. Uh, uh, your book. I want to discuss some parts of it, but before we do, for those who uh, apparently slept through much of high school, could you perhaps give an overview um, as to what Copernicus's revolutionary idea was, uh, and more importantly, what was the astronomical view that it supplanted? Yeah, I um, I did a lot of things through high school. Sleeping wasn't one of them. Misbehaving was largely my forte. And uh, I certainly never learned about Copernicus, to the best of my recollection. So um, it's very straightforward. From the first glimpses of the, that humans looked into the sky, it looks like the sun is moving around the earth, right? We watched the sun rise in the east. We watched the sun set in the west. It goes over our heads. And while it changes through the year... That is clear. We watch the stars revolve over our heads as well. And it's clear then, just by observation, that we are the station, we are stationary. After all, we don't feel like we're moving. It's clear that then we are stationary and the sun is revolving around the earth. That's what it looks like. That's what all the evidence points to. And so, literally, from the beginning of history until um, some, that there was some times that the, uh, the, the Greeks had figured this out, but Let's really sort of go straight to, to Copernicus, really, as, aside from a slight Greek detour, where they seem to support the motion of the Earth and not the Sun. Uh, Copernicus came along. He was this um, this this uh, Polish, um, not quite a priest, but um, but you know, a gentleman of the Bible, who came up with this uh, theory that it wasn't really that the um, that the sun was moving over the earth, but it was the other way around, that the sun was stationary and the earth was moving. And he came up with this theory that, of course, number one, was a big problem for people, because when you look outside, that doesn't look like what's going on. And number two, the Bible seems, and the word here is seems, the Bible seems to support the idea that it is the earth that is stationary and the sun is moving. So, he comes along with this theory. He publishes a book called The Revolutionibus. If you find a first edition copy of that now, it'll probably cost you north of $3 million. And um, and it took a while for it to become accepted uh, and trickle down both into general science, into Christian thought, and certainly into Jewish thought. And in my book, I look at all three parts, how the how the theory was accepted in the scientific world, how it was accepted in the Jewish world, and also by comparison, what it was doing to the Christian thinkers out there. Excellent. Um, So if you could give us, before we jump into the Jewish reception, um, just so we can have our timelines line up one with another, could you perhaps give us a a brief overview of the reception of Copernicus views in the general scientific community, just that our timelines line up and we can see when we can expect it to be uh, accepted or at least discussed within the Jewish world? Yeah, for sure. So this is really a very interesting point. When Copernicus wrote his book, there was not really any scientific support for his theory. It was a theory, in fact, 
the uh, introduction to his book, which was not written by Copernicus, but was written by his publisher, um, makes it clear that everything in this book is sort of theoretical only. We don't take it to be <laughs> literally true. And this was, of course, written to placate the Catholic Church. Um, so everything in the Copernican thought uh, was theoretical. There was no hard evidence for it. That evidence really built up sort of in the 18th century, but really doesn't come through to the 1830s with the discovery of, not discovery of, but the proof of, 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 uh, of stellar parallax that the stars seem to change position in the sky over a six-month course, and it's because that we're moving, not, the, not because the, 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 uh, the stars are moving. So you have this theory that was sort of floating around from the 1540s all the way to the 1830s, almost 300 years, and, and no hard proof to back it up. Um, I was actually very interested in this. This is what actually attracted me to the whole area of Copernicus. I was um, struggling with uh, the latest findings in neuroscience, if you allow a diversion, um, where it seems that the the ability for us to choose with free will is, is becoming less and less as we understand more and more of the brain. Uh, but much of this is still theoretical. And I was thinking, what's a good model of how something that was a theoretical challenge to traditional Jewish thought later becomes accept, much more accepted once the, the evidence is in? And that way, perhaps I thought, could we think, think about the challenge of, to, uh, of free will Given that the evidence is not quite in, but it's but it's building up. So, in any event, certainly for the first few hundred years, Copernicus is not widely accepted. Just to give you uh, one example, and there are many, the famous English philosopher Francis Bacon, who died in 1626, published a, a uh, criticism of Copernicus in 1623. So, most of the scientific world was interested, understood it, but did not yet accept it for for truth with a capital T. Even though they had some support, for example, the works of Galileo and others, which, uh, which lent credence to it. Yes, and this is what happened. You see, JJ, over the next centuries, more and more evidence was brought on to support. So when Galileo made his telescopic, when he used his telescope to identify the, the moons around, uh, around Jupiter, that, that caused a great consternation because it showed that there are moons outside of the Earth, orbiting not, not the Earth, but orbiting another body, right? Now, this doesn't prove that the Copernican theory was right. It just proves that somewhere in the solar system, there are things going around other things that are not the sun. So slowly but surely, this evidence built up. Um, as, as measurements became better and better, the, um, the Copernican theory really replaced what was before it, which we haven't spoken about, but it was the Ptolemaic theory in which the Earth is at the center and everything else goes around the Earth. And then to account for various problems with observation, you make things called epicycles, which are basically the, the things that revolve around the Earth themselves revolve around something else. It's all very complicated uh, and unsatisfactory. But after a while, the, 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 the experimental evidence really built up to such a degree that it was virtually impossible to, um, to ignore the Copernican model. And, and that evidence built up, you, would you say, in the 19th century or early 20th? Uh, really, by 18, 1830, you know, we, we think about the first real, I mean, Foucault's pendulum, for example. Foucault's pendulum is that, I'm sure all of your listeners have seen one in the Science Museum. It's that great pendulum that swings back and forth and knocks down pins on the floor uh, over 12 hours, and it gets back to its original point. Now, while this was this was evidence that the Earth was moving, right? Because what's happening is the pendulum is sw swinging back and forth in space, not moving, and it's the Earth underneath that is moving. So when Foucault demonstrated his pendulum in the, in the 19th century, again, that didn't prove that the Earth was going around the sun, but it did prove that the Earth was somehow moving. So all of these things build up until, you know, the evidence is, is overwhelming and, uh, and it's, uh, it's very hard to be a... a um, a non-Copernican these days, although, of course, there are people who are out there who believe that. Yes. Well, and we'll get there. That's actually a fascinating part of the story. Before we get into the, the, the details of the Jewish, um, uh, of the various Jewish thinkers who reacted to it in one way or another, I mean, just in a general overview, um, what is at stake in this debate? Uh, meaning, you know, the, 
many, many, Jew- you in your book list over 50 um, different Jewish thinkers, some very obscure, some absolutely at the center of, of Jewish intellectual life over the four or five centuries between Copernicus and the 21st century, who either defend this position of Copernicus or attack it or, or somewhere in between. Um, and what are the issues that are at stake in this? Why would they take an interest in it? And what depends upon this answer? Right. Well, you know, the Copernican revolution really was part of that great thing that we call the scientific revolution. And scholars debate when exactly it began and when exactly it ended, but it's sometime in the 16th century to sometime, you know, in the 19th century. There was all this discovery. There was the telescope was 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 uh, was widely used, especially by Galileo, and people started doing experiments up and down mountains to measure barometric pressure and the identity of... of, of um, of the elements was being discovered one by one by one. And there was this massive, massive avalanche of brand new knowledge. And I think it's impossible for us to really take in just how how massive that was. And prior to this, the only accepted source of all knowledge was the Bible. The Bible had been seen not as the source of knowledge about God and the history of the Jews or the history of Jesus. The Bible was seen as the source of all knowledge. And along comes the scientific revolution, perhaps led by this, this, this understanding that the earth is not at the center. And it shows that the Bible is not the source of knowledge, but it's a source of knowledge about something very particular. And it's also not a terribly reliable source of knowledge at that. So what you have at stake is really the status of the Torah, the status of the Bible in general, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of commentary that suddenly become threatened. Because, of course, if one part of the Bible is incorrect, then what's to become of the rest of it? Either the Bible is the is the word of God, as it, of course, had been almost universally accepted up until then, or it's not. And if and if God didn't get one part right, why why do we believe he got others right? So although this might seem a rather obscure thing on which to uh, write a whole book, it's really a fundamental challenge to the way that Jews and non-Jews, Jews and Christians particularly, look at the Bible as a source of truth and as a source of knowledge. Interesting. And of course, not just the Bible, but also the writings of the Talmud. And and, and later, you know, for example, if you open up the early books of the Mishnah Torah of Maimonides, um, the first few chapters of Sefer Hamada is a very, uh, quite wonderfully succinct description of this Ptolemaic uh, system of, of, of astronomy. That's right on which he hangs a lot of his own metaphysics. So it's, you know, it's not merely a theoretical debate. I mean... No, people, I mean, you know, the Rambam is writing La Halacha. So La Halacha, the Rambam is writing the, all this stuff about uh, the way that the stars and the epis, uh, and the planets and the and, and, and revolve. And um, that apparently the Rambam thought was important enough for every Jew who wants to be educated to sit and learn it, right? It's no more or less important than the other Halachot about making brochas in the morning or Hilchus Gittin. It's all part of the same thing. Uh, yes, and, uh, and and to have you know a Polish priest or, or almost priest come along and uh, you know propose an alternative theory, one can see why there might be objections. So, so as I said before, there th- we can categorize all the thinkers that you spoke about and described in your book into basically three distinct groups: those who defended Copernicus and thought his theories were excellent, uh, those who rejected him uh, and his theories, and those who uh, occupied some sort of middle position or some sort of wary or skeptical position uh, in the middle. So let's start with the first category, which are those who who, ac- who accepted him and thought this was you know a cutting edge science and and something that could certainly be reconciled with Jewish checks. And the first, the first person, perhaps the main one of, of the early modern period, was a fascinating Italian thinker known as Yashar of Candia, uh, or, or Josef Shlomo del Medigo. Uh, could you tell, tell us a little bit about him and um, you know, his relationship to the science of the time and, and why he was uh, keen on Copernicus's ideas? Yeah, I visited the, uh, the grave of uh, Josef del Medigo in Prague, uh, it was especially meaningful for me, uh, having written so much about him, a fascinating figure, almost one could say a personal hero of mine insofar as I have any personal heroes. Um, so Yosef uh, Del Medigo, I call in my book, the first Jewish Copernican. He was the first, certainly the first person to publish uh, his support for the Copernican model, for the heliocentric model in which the sun is stationary and everything in the solar system revolves around it. He was born in Candia in Crete in 1591 to a very wealthy family, and so could really spend the rest of his life studying, which is something that I think 
you and I, JJ, should have planned a little bit better so that we could spend the rest of our lives studying without having to think about an income. Very poor planning of us not to be born to millionaires. Yeah, poor planning on our part. But in any event, he born to this very wealthy family. His grandparents, his grandfather and his father were rabbis. He goes to yeshiva. And then at the age of 15, he's now able to speak uh, Hebrew and Italian and Spanish and Greek and Polish. And at the age of 15, he goes to Italy. He's involved in the University of Padua, uh, which was the leading medical school at the time. Uh, and interestingly, it allowed Protestants and Jews to study there, even though it was a Catholic institution. And so for seven years, uh, Del Medico is studying at the University of Padua, and he studies astronomy and what was called natural science, which, which is really science today and medicine. And there, believe it or not, he was taught by a man called Galileo Galilei. He actually was taught by the famous Galileo. And in his book, which he later published, he describes looking through the very telescope that Galileo was using. It, it, it's one of them, one of those passages in Jewish intellectual history that, 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 that sends a shiver through my spine. In any event, he's, uh, he's taught by man and other people, Galileo, who becomes a physician. Uh, and he then wanders around a little bit and eventually settles down in Amsterdam, where he meets Menashe ben Israel, who had founded the first Hebrew printing press there. And he this relationship resulted in the publication of his first book, Sefer Elim, in 1629. He later then moved to Prague and died in Prague in 1655 and is buried there in the famous uh, Jewish cemetery, which, as I said, I, I've seen. Sefer Elim is a very long book, 400 pages, and it deals with pretty much everything, philosophy and science and math. And it's in this book that he uh, writes, as I said, that um, the, 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 the Copernican view in which the sun is the center and the earth uh, is revolving around it, this is the correct one. And um, this really is what is what makes him the first Jewish Copernican. If I can just uh, th think again about what, what you asked earlier about what, what other people were doing at this time. So at the time that Del Medigo was writing in Hebrew and publishing in Amsterdam, that Copernicus was correct. Um, uh, the Dutch universities were moving very slowly. It, it wasn't for about seven or eight years after Del Medigo's book that there was the first fully-fledged Copernican at, a, at an Amsterdam university. Uh, and so the very fact that, that Del Medigo was writing this at all and publishing it in Hebrew was really remarkable, given that the rest of the academic world at the time had not caught up quite as quite yet so that that begadol if you like is is um is yosef del medigo uh as i said one of the one of my personal heroes uh and the first unabashed jewish copernican well as i said the, it seems the rest of the academic world didn't have the privilege of studying studying astronomy literally with galileo yeah I and mean, looking through his telescopes that's uh i have to tell you the hebrew passage is remarkably goes shekain heid galileos rebi she'ien b'madim he says, this, um, is the, this, this, this is what my Rebbe, now, I don't know how you're going to translate Rebbe here, but presumably it means teacher. Teacher or master, perhaps. Master. Um, this is what he saw when he looked through uh, and he saw Mars in a certain way. So here is a famous phrase in Jewish intellectual history, Galileus Rebbe, my master, my teacher, Galileo. But what is interesting, of course, is that the very fact that Del Medigo was doing real astronomy, looking through telescopes, was, I think, very important in the fact that he was the first Jewish Copernican. Uh, as I tried to make the point in my book several times, it's the power of the people that you are taught by that leaves us indelible impression. And so very often, I believe it was the personalities who were associated with people that led them to, um, to, to adopt the positions that they took. And even though Galileo at the time had not formally expressed or taught the truth of the Copernican model, um, he must have been quite a quite a forceful character, and I think that rubbed off on um, on Del Medico. Interesting, because of course many other Jews uh, of that century uh, were busy writing against Copernicus uh, and busy, right. you know, the, condemning him uh, in, in many quite forceful ways. Well, it's interesting that you talk about um, the force of personality uh, versus the force of scientific, uh, shall we say, evidence or, or advancements, um, because of course, as you notice in your book the endorsements of Copernicus sharply 
rise in the late 18th and 19th century when the evidence starts to pile up more and more that essentially that he's correct and, and it becomes almost incontrovertible. Uh, and you point out there are many uh, masculine people like uh, Solomon Maimon and Yitzhak Shmuel Regio um, and others, and even more conservative figures like Rishim Shrafal Hirsch, who, who essentially who endorse uh, the, Copernican, um, the Copernican model. And I wanted to ask, I mean, do you think this was simply as a result of the building scientific consensus like I described here? Or were there other factors involved because this is this is the interesting thing you know what would motivate someone to su- start supporting or start discussing that particular theory was it perhaps part of the sort of european wide pushback against the catholic church against the old ideas was this part of what it meant to be an enlightened individual do you think was to, to sort of start embracing new theories including copernicus what were the motivations of those um and again we're, we're discussing many different sort of a wide variety of figures but in general what were the motivation especially of those masculine who saw it uh, as as important to embrace copernicus so you know you briefly mentioned Shimshon Rafael Hirsch and he sort of sidestepped the issue and this is important because he didn't really think about it, it, which which model is true he simply said the, the 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 Torah is the book of science so why are you treating it as that now that's this in itself is a remarkable remarkable thing to to say and um again because the the, the bible of the torah had always been seen as the source of knowledge on everything the torah and the talmud of course so to re, you know, to slightly, what's the right word, to fine tune the sights, of, if, if you like, and say, well, listen, there's no conflict here because actually the Bible isn't teaching us anything other than, than ethics and Musa and mitzvot. You know, and the famous phrase is the Bible, the, the Bible te- doesn't teach you how the heavens go. The Bible teaches you how to go to heaven. You know, so, so there's just one example of, of, of somebody facing the uh, the question of uh, of new science and sort of sidestepping this, you and I think in a very elegant way. And I think the, the 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 Hirschian model of the Torah as not being a book of science is probably one that the vast majority of your listeners surely would would agree with. I think so. Although it is perhaps worth pointing out that such statements are often made once once the scientific consensus goes against what the Torah seems to be saying. One has to say that in the 19th century, whereas if Rosh Hashanah here was living in the time of the Rambam or living in the time, you know, of Sadiqan or whatever it was, he likely would have said, no, I mean, the Torah says things, or the Tanakh says things like, va'aretz olam omedet or something, that the earth constantly stands still. And here, here you have it, you know, isn't this obvious that this teaches what we think is co- co- current science, which is the earth stands still and everything else moves around it. Um, I mean, it, it, it just seems to be to sort of be a, a retrospective exegetical move uh, as opposed to, uh, you know... Um, yeah, that, no, I, th- I think that's right, but it is a move. And I, I, look, I don't know how much this really was influenced by the by the outside world. I think it did become uh, the question of whether or not you supported the Copernican model came as sort of a, a litmus test or whether you were a card-carrying muscular or not. And I have lots of examples of this in the book. But it seemed to be sort of that the real musculium were the ones who accepted Copernicus and the others, you know, they were sort of on the fringes. And I think you can find, as I said, uh, many examples of this. So, um, yeah, the scientific evidence is building up. I, I don't think that, you know, the hardcore rabbis, as, as we might call them, the, the rabbis who stayed in the world of the yeshiva um, were really much moved by this. I mean, just look at the, the, the Hassan Sofa, who's writing in the 1860s, who, who writes that, um, God forbid that any wise Jew would accept this lie. Uh, so there were certainly people who were sort of Keeping the traditional hardcore path, uh, but at least two students of the of the Hassam Sofa went very different ways. One continued to support his uh, his Rebbe, and another one called uh, Eliezer Lippmann Neustadt, who was a, a favoured student of the Hassam Sofa, writes in his May Menuchos that one should absolutely believe in the Copernican model. He goes, "Who is more natural believable, the person who sits in the base of Medrash?" And this is what he writes. Or the vast number of scientists and astronomers who dedicate their lives to the study of science. Uh, so this is an interesting example of uh, of, a, of a powerful personality, the Chassam Sofer, who has two students, and they take diametrically different paths in their accept in their in their acceptance or rejection of the theory. It's a complicated story, and I, I'm sure there are many many factors, many of which are the social and personal that go into somebody's um, sort of makeup to, that would then lead them to to take one path or another on, on this debate. 
But it's interesting that this uh, this student of the Chazan you mentioned, uh, Neustadt, so he, I mean, the position he takes is, is a strikingly modern position, even though he himself is an extremely traditional uh, rabbi, but it's a strikingly mo- modern position, which is that essentially there are different um, different disciplines and different experts in different disciplines. And, and you wouldn't expect that someone who spent his whole life in the Beit Midrash learning uh, the Talmud would be an expert in a discipline not related to the Talmud. And this is, I mean, you know, I, I assume most of the listeners uh, to this podcast would agree with some version of that. However, that is that certainly wasn't the position of many who lived before the scientific revolution. And this is, again, this is, this is certainly the, the sort of infiltration of, of these modern uh, waves. Um, Let's move a little bit into the other camps, the opposite camp of those who rejected Copernicus. Now, the truth is that in the in the 1500s and 1600s, there were many, you know, uh, you bring up a David Gantz uh, in his encyclopedia, and you bring up a uh, Tovio Cohen, the, the Maase Tovia, uh, you know, these, um, these sort of compilers of various works of Hebraic um, early scientific works. But the truth is that in those centuries, it wasn't so difficult to be anti-Copernican because a huge portion of, of intellectual Europe and certainly the entire church uh, was was uh, against Copernicus in this particular regard. Um, however, some later thinkers also were, and I, I'd like to bring up one or two of them. One that I'd like to bring up is um, David Nieto, who was uh, actually a very interesting man because he was an, a rabbi living in England at the time in the late uh, late 18th century, and he was basically the example of an English maskil. Uh, he was a very literate and very scientifically uh, knowledgeable individual uh, writing in the late 18th century. However, he he dismisses Copernicus. He, he, you know, throws him out, which is a, a surprisingly antiquated theory on his part. Surprisingly, you know, antiquated position. So, can you talk a little bit firstly about the man himself, but also what led him to make that particular uh, judgment call? So, David Nieto, actually, his his um, his burial place is in London um, and can I think still be visited. Um, he uh, was born in 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 Italy. Uh, where he bes- becomes a, a Dayan and a Rav, and then um, he, he he moves around a bit, but moves to London in 1701, and he actually immediately got into trouble. Immediately got into trouble. He became the Rav of the Sephardi uh, community in London, and um, one of the uh, Balabatim, uh, or the Gvirim, as I think they're called today, one of the people with deep pockets who built the synagogue charged that Nieto had made claims of heresy, um, because he had perhaps identified God as nature, which was Spinozan, uh, and so on. In any event, he he's accused of this, and um, he writes a, a book to defend himself. Eventually, this thing just blows up and reaches um, the leading figure in in uh, in, in Svadik jury, who was the Hacham Tzvi Ashkenazi, who was living in, then in Altona, and eventually the Hacham Tzvi rules that David Nieto was not a heretic, and that ends. So that gives you a sense that this man had really, um, from his first arrival in London, been the been, been the focus of some pretty nasty accusations that had surely um, had an effect on him. Um, his most famous work is called Mate Dan, Dan standing for, it means the rod of Dan, but Dan is Daniel, uh, David Nieto, excuse me, the rod of judgment, or, but it's really the, the rod of David Nieto. Um, and it's built on the uh, the way that the Kuzari is written, where you have a king who's asking questions, and uh, it goes back and forth. And sort of the question that we have is, did Nieto really believe what the, the voices of the people that he was writing? When the king uh, in his book seems to express uh, a, an opinion that's a, that holds that the Copernican model is not true, is that just the king's opinion, but not Nieto's? Or is Nieto speaking through through the king. And I think Nieto's writings, without going into too much detail, they can be read in, in different ways. And, you know, the reader is a little bit perplexed as to what he really believes in. In, in one part, he seems to be rejecting Copernican, Copernican thought without reservation. Then he offers a more subtle uh, subtle uh, analysis of the problem. But I think uh, ultimately... He does reject the Copernican model because of the need, and this is important, the need to read the Bible literally. Now, was this an, a, as a result of the fact that he'd been accused of heresy and for him to now write that Copernicus is right and the Bible therefore seems to be incorrect and therefore he would open himself up to more charges of heresy? We don't know this, but I think it has to be taken into account that, th- that this man wasn't writing in a vacuum. And that when, while he rejected Copernicus, he himself 
had come very close to losing his his job and perhaps even being excommunicated for holding certain beliefs that were thought to be completely antithetical to Judaism and heretical. So you think that um, so the literary form of the book Mate Dan uh, may have been a sort of elaborate cover for, for Nieto's views because if it would have been too avant-garde for him to accept Copernicus, then by putting different arguments in the mouth of different protagonists, that would have saved him. He could just throw up his hands and say, that's not my opinion, that's the opinion of this particular character in a particular book. Right, I'm not saying it. Look, at the end of the day, he does. Uh, he seems to be sympathetic, but ultimately he does reject it. We don't know exactly you know, what, what, what was the, 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 the tipping point, if you like, but I, I am a big believer that People's biographies play a, a very important part in 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 what they write, and we must we ignore that our peril. I mean, obviously they do. Then what else could we be but products of our environment? Uh, and so you're saying that the possibly the early charge of heresy levelled against him made him far more cautious going forward. I think that's a very reasonable assumption. Yes. Right. Yes. Interesting. Okay, fair enough. Um, so, as I mentioned before, there were those who rejected Copernicus in the 18th century. This seems to be at least you know, a reasonable option, uh, given that, as you say, the, the evidence had not yet piled up. Right. So just to interrupt, so David Nieto had, was writing at least a century before there was hard, solid evidence for stellar parallax. So he was still writing in that theoretical uh, time. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. So that was going on at the time. Um, however, there even quite significantly after the build-up of hard scientific evidence for Copernicus's theory, uh, there were still many who seemed to reject it. I'd like to uh, focus on one who was, of course, an extremely influential figure, which is uh, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, who was, of course, the seventh uh, Rebbe of, uh, of Lubavitch. Um, and, um, and he, writing in the 1960s, so this is a full century after the vast portion of, uh, you know, of the scientific world had accepted this. And curiously, um, even that, that was also the decade, I believe, that the Catholic Church officially uh, accepted and officially uh, um, sort of gave the rubber stamp to the theories of Copernicus and, and Galileo, uh, which, of course, you know, a few centuries too late, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> but, but in that very same decade, that even when the Catholic Church was coming around, uh, the seventh Rebbe of Lubavitch was penning a letter in which at least he seems to be saying that the Copernican um, theory is wrong, or at least that we are wrong to rely upon it. Yes. Um, you know, nothing gets me more male than talking about the Rebbe's opinion here um, uh, and suggesting that it was that the Rebbe was barking up the wrong tree. Look, you're right. When the Rebbe wrote this in, uh, you know, he, he, he tells a, there's a bizarre story that's told that a man couldn't accept uh, the Torah of Judaism was true uh, until uh, and somebody said, look, the Lubavitcher Rebbe himself, who you agree is a great man, he believes that the world is stationary and the sun revolves around the earth. That's the power of his belief. If he can believe that, why can't you believe the Torah is true? And the man says, well, you have to take me to see the Rebbe and see. And, and, and at the end of the day, you know, the Rebbe says what he says and the man is convinced. Um, now, this story, which I recount with references in the book, is a very silly story. It's bizarre in every possible way. A bizarre story and not exactly a reason for anybody to pin their faith on on, on something. But, you know, to this day, um, it's taken as axiomatic that the Rebbe declared that the world is stationary and the sun goes round the earth. And the support for this, and I have a whole chapter in the book on, on Copernicus in the Space Age and the Apollo Age, is, is, is quoting Einstein's theory of relativity. Everything is relative. And therefore, it's just as kosher, if you like, to say that the earth is stationary and the sun is rolling around it as it is relatively to say that the sun is stationary and the earth is revolving around it. Now, while that may be true for some descriptions, it's absolutely silly to suggest that this is a real description of reality. Einstein didn't believe this. He actually writes, uh, Einstein writes how people are abusing, abusing his theory of relativity for all sorts of nonsense. But nevertheless, uh, yeah, the, the Rebbe does, th does say this, um, and people point to the Rebbe, uh, uh, you know, as a great master of both worlds. Um, actually, if you read some of the uh, biographies of him, I'm talking about Heilman and, and Friedman's book, uh, uh, The Rebbe, there's not actually a record that the Rebbe attended the Sorbonne and um, he apparently didn't uh, acquire a degree or academic credit from the University of Berlin. This is not in any way to take away from what the Rebbe did. He wasn't in, this wasn't his focus and nor should it have been. And what he achieved 
was remarkable. But certainly in the in the field of science, I don't think it's a good idea to take the Lubavitcher Rebbe as a fine example of the synthesis of Torah and science uh, and the use of Einstein's theory of relativity to prove that, yes, indeed, you can say that the Earth is stationary. It doesn't work like that. Right. Interesting. So, so then the question becomes, so why would he say that? Uh, in other words, w- was it simply a dogmatic um, stance on biblical literalism that if we have data seemingly for the Bible and from, uh, from Chazal, then we ought to take that as fact unless we have over either unless we have overwhelming evidence to the contrary, or even beyond that, even if we do have overwhelming evidence to the contrary, nothing can overturn the um, the authority of the Bible. Nothing can overturn the, the factual authority of, of the rabbis. Do you think that was the basis of his unwillingness to to accept Copernicus, or, or something else? Meaning, had it nothing to do with textual readings and everything to do with his understanding of Einstein or his understanding of something else? I mean, do we, can you conjecture as to this? I can't. I mean, I, I have no idea what drove him to say it. And I can't believe that he would have been in any way less successful as a, as a, as a charismatic leader of the as a large number of Jewish people had he accepted the Copernican theory. I simply, I simply don't know. Um, but there it is. That's, that's what the record shows. There's no getting away from that. And you say that uh, followers of the Rebbe have tried to to spare his blushes uh, in some way or another. Have, have any of them? Yeah, yes, I, I get, I get, you know, I, I, I do get emails. Uh, as I said, uh, this, this seems to be something that, um, that sparks a lot of, of interest. And the email says, you know, usually begins with, uh, dear Dr. Brown, you're totally wrong about the Rebbe and what he said. And, and then I would write back and say, listen, terrific. Thank you for writing. Please send me the evidence and I'll correct Oftentimes, I've been posting uh, on my on my on my site Talmudology, where we, for example, we talk about the eclipse and the Lubavitcher Rebbe's um, writings on the on the solar eclipse. And I'm saying, well, show me what you know. Show me the show me the sayings or the evidence, and I'm happy to correct the post. And nobody's ever written back. None of the, none of the people who've gotten very hot under the collar about what I had said have written back. So uh, you know, I understand the Rebbe is a remarkable figure and held in high esteem. Sometimes in the highest esteem. Uh, and uh, and that's fine, but um, you know his record on on certain scientific statements is what it is. He's certainly not the latest uh, person to, to hold those views. You bring examples in the introduction of your book of a uh, was it a, a textbook or something in in modern day Israel uh, written by I think a former yes. former member of Knesset or something. Yes, yes, yes. Asamayim Masaprim. Yes, um, the uh, member of the Knesset, Shlomo ben Isri, uh, former member of the Knesset, member of the Shas party, published a lovely book called Hashemayim Masaprim, The Heavens Proclaim, in 2003. Uh, and he, it's beautiful illustrations about how the stars work and the heavens work, and Kiddush HaChodesh, the sanctification of the Jewish new month, which is based on the cycle of the moon. Uh, and then he writes that um, he is clear that um, that his allegiances are with uh, the traditional, uh, you know, with, with traditional Jewish teaching on this so far as he describes it. And um, he also, incidentally, JJ, cites Einstein and writes that the statement by Professor Einstein, it's not possible to determine which of two objects is really orbiting the other. And then he writes, we must believe and accept the statements of our rabbis that the earth is the center. Now, as I show in my book, it depends which rabbis you look at. There are plenty of rabbis who say, of course, the earth's not at the center. We know that's not true. But Shlomo ben Isri here is, a, is, is taking a, what might, you know, a more literalist, uh, a more right-wing uh, stance in which uh, we can't get away from the, from the text of the Torah, which suggests that the earth is moving. There are not many of them, but a couple of them suggest uh, that the earth is not moving. And yes, and so you have a member of the Knesset who um, who believes that the earth is the center of the, uni- of the of the solar system, of the universe, and the sun is revolving around it. What I find fascinating about this phenomenon, both of, the, of Ben Israel and, uh, and the Baba Chereba, is that both of them hang their words on, on a great scientific authority. In other words, they both invoke Einstein. Now, the, the truth is that that I think it would be perhaps uh, maybe more honest or more um, more intellectually consistent, let's say, to just say, no, this is what the Torah s- says, and this is what the, the, the Talmud says. And even if every single scientist in the entire world said the, said the opposite, I'm not willing to uh, contravene the authority of the sacred text. But both of them have to, you know, try and muddy the scientific waters through, let's say, a very dubious um, 
invocation of one of the great scientific uh, uh, thinks of the 20th century. Yeah, I think th- th- this is, you know, this is this is an example, and there are many examples, especially when we get into questions of the theory of evolution, um, where it's best to either, <laughs> you know, say, I don't care what the science says, I don't believe in it, or I don't, I don't, or I have a higher source, than it is to try and cherry pick uh, certain quotes, because at the end of the day, there is a scientific consensus. And um, if you're outside of the scientific consensus and you, you pull a quote to try and support your posi- your religious position, uh, it'll become very clear to uh, to anybody who wants to examine these things that you're cherry picking. And, and I think that actually does a disservice to your position. Look, there are many wonderful reasons to observe Jewish practice. Whether or not the sun goes around the earth is not one of them. That's not one of them. <laughs> uh, fair enough. You know, again, I can't say I disagree, but um, basically th- th- those who oppose this position could invoke the slippery slope argument. You say, ah, listen, if you start saying that the description in Genesis chapter one or various other descriptions, um, you know, are incorrect, that, you know, the Shamayim, the, the heavens are not actually a rakia, literally a dome above the earth, you know, some sort of uh, a dome-like structure, um, then, you know, who knows what, you know, then you'll call into question the historicity of the Bible. And then you'll call into question the, uh, you know, the, the narrative of, of Mount Sinai. And you'll call into question, you know, the Passover story. You'll call into question everything. Um, so, so, meaning, while I don't personally hold of it, I, I am sympathetic to a shall we say, a purist position, which says that there's no secular authority in the world that can overturn a plain text reading of a biblical verse. Right. Are you absolutely right? It is threatening. But, you know, within our tradition, people have dealt with this. And we we mentioned Shimshon Rafal Hirsch earlier. He has no problem accepting the Copernican model because he said the Torah is not a textbook of science. And I think if we see uh, the Torah as not a necessarily a history book or a textbook of science, but as the the, the 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 narrative story of the foundations of the Jewish people, then it doesn't matter if here or there there are what, again, only some people might see as fundamental problems. Uh, there are plenty of people uh, card-carrying from rabbis who I cite in the book who have no problem reassessing the Torah in the light of, of modern science. And by the way, we all know that the Rambam was prepared to do that too. Yeah, of course. And this becomes a bit more dicey when it comes to the theory of evolution because that was, that's was been resisted much more. But we will, of course, have to wait till your, for your next book, uh, Dr. Brown, which will trace the Jewish reaction to Darwin. It's already been done by people far more... Uh, uh, far more, far more uh, in, involved and skilled at it. Rachel Pearl has, uh, uh, Pear has written a lot. Uh, there are some very good books out there. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, the, the third group that uh, that I invoked are, are some figures who you bring who are perhaps not exactly partisans of either approach or, or skeptical towards it. Uh, but I'd like to bring one uh, major example, which is Rabbi Yaakov Emden, who was perhaps one of the the great rabbis of the uh, of the early modern period, and certainly a fiery polemicist and and you know a man of, of very uh, shall we say, definite opinions and not uh, not uh, shy in sharing them. Um, so what was his attitude to, to, to this in general and, um, and you know, and to scientific theories in, you know, more generally? Yeah. So Rav Yaakov Emden, as you said, a very important uh, figure in the, in, in, the, in the early modern period. Uh, but one has to be careful with Rav Yaakov Emden because uh, he had a printing press in his basement which allowed him to print his own books without, without problem. And when you, when you do that, you can print an awful lot of stuff. And so the question is, you know, what did Rav Yaakov Emden believe about the Copernican model? It, dep- it really depends on sort of which phase of his life you look at. And, um, and, 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 and then you'll sort of come up with different, uh, with different approaches to what he said. So, for example... In his early work, which um, which was his commentary called Moruk Tzi on the Shulchan Aruch, he seems to sub- describe a Ptolemaic model. Um, he seems to describe that. About twenty years later, um, even the, yeah, about twenty years later, at the age of about forty four, he writes a commentary on the Siddur, in which he writes that it would seem that the Copernican model is correct. He says that God called it, you know. When God called the dry area Aretz in, 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 in Bereshis, he writes that some explain the word 
Aretz comes from the word rutz, meaning to run, meaning that the earth is in movement. So here's Yav- Yaakov Emden suggesting that the Copernican model is correct. And later, during his protracted battles with, with Jonathan Ibershetz, who he accused of having uh, of being a Sabbatean, he published, so Emden published a commentary on Pirkei Avot, Ethics of the Fathers. Uh, and actually, in that, he questions whether astronomy in general can tell us anything about the universe. Uh, and um, he questions whether the Copernican model is correct. So he seemed to have, at different phases of his life, held slightly inconsistent views. We all do that. We all go through phases in which we believe one thing and then another. But I think that we can't really describe Jakob Emden as having one specific view on the Copernican model. He seems to have changed his mind a couple of times. And I suppose that makes sense also, considering that Jakob Emden was living precisely in an age, I think he died in 1776, precisely a period where, where you did have evidence for one, but also a fair amount of authorities on the other side as well. Yeah, I, I, the, the, of course, the question is, how much did, how much did, did Rav Yaakov Emden read or understand of what was going on in the, you know, in the universities around him? I, have, I, I can't answer that. Um, but um, we all know that Jewish communities are ultimately influenced by the communities in which they reside, however high the ghetto wall or however different Jewish language there are the truth, the, almost the existential truth of the Jewish people is that they are influenced by um, by the society around them. And uh, yes, I, I'm sure that, 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 that some of this uh, may have leaked through uh, to Rav Yaakov Emden, but I'm not in any way suggesting that he was a, a close and avid reader of the scientific journals of the day such as they were. Right. Yes, no, I, I suppose that is part of the difficulty of doing what you did, which is drawing a, a very lengthy and well-populated intellectual history because unless one delves very, very deeply and finely into all aspects of a specific thinker, it's very difficult to, sometimes, often, very difficult to ascertain exactly the level of engagement with an outside, you know, with the scientific literature of their time. Um, and especially as many of the thinkers that you you, you speak about have not really uh, been, you know, received a very thorough, let's say, academic treatment or have not been excavated completely. I mean, many of them are, uh, uh, you know, either obscure or only known to to a uh, you know, select few people. Yeah, um, and and as you say, writing a, a, a an adequate intellectual biography means being aware of all of the uh, all of the events in somebody's life. Did they lose parents at an early age? Did the the, the couple have a miscarriage early on? That may, you know all of these all of these factors that we that, that make us who we are as human beings. They all feed into how we eventually arrive at the opinions that we have, and, I, and that for me is is what makes this subject of Jewish intellectual history so endlessly fascinating, that yes, you can have two students of the Hasam Sofer with diametrically opposed positions about the role of the yeshiva versus the university. What was it about these two people? They lived, in the, they lived within 20 miles of each other. They both had the same illustrious teacher, the Hasam Sofer, yet they came away with very different opinions about this. So what was it about their personal lives that might explain what they what what they wrote about and how they thought this to me is a, is a is a fascinating question it is it is and i i want to you know pose perhaps a broader methodological question um based upon all this uh which is as follows which is that you know those traditionalists who want to um sort of preserve let's say traditional ideas or, or long held beliefs about the scientific world or about history against the consensus of scientists or historians they often adopt the following line which is that well you know scientific theories change all the time what was thought 100 years ago is not what is necessarily thought today and what is thought today is not necessarily be thought in 100 years time and therefore you know we're not going to radically change our religious beliefs based on what is believed in the year 2024 because after all in the year 2094 or 2154 who knows what were they going to believe and therefore it is foolish to try and do that. Um, and of course, there is some credibility. To, I, mean, I mean, the claim is historically in many ways correct. Having said that, the Copernican uh, example is actually a very instructive example because this is a, an example of an idea which is now a very old idea. It's, it's at least 500 years old. Um, it's had many centuries with which to collect evidence. And it seems that the massive weight of evidence, uh, you know, c- collected by scientists now for centuries, um, c- comes down on the side that, in fact, Copernicus is correct, that the earth rev- revolves around the sun. And my, my question is, does there come a point in which we can say the science is settled? That now we know 
It is not hypothesized, but we can fairly say that we know that the earth revolves around the sun. And therefore, the critique of, oh, well, science changes and therefore, you know, we can't set store by it, that, that starts to crumble at a point where there's a, like a sledgehammering, uh, overwhelming pile of evidence to suggest it. Well, this is a very deep question, a very deep question that I would love to talk at, at length about. But look, um, I've written elsewhere, actually, that the rabbinic notion of science, the traditional rabbinic notion of science, which is the one you suggested, and I mentioned several examples in my book, oh, why should we listen to science? These scientists, they come along, they, there's a different opinion every few years, a different scientific fact. Um, why should we listen to them? But that's not what science does. And science has never, ever claimed, scientists have never claimed to be absolutely right. Yes, you will cherry pick examples here and there of people who wrote 100 years ago or 200 years ago. But I'm talking about, you know, our, our recent t history. And, and I think the best example that I know of is uh, Richard Feynman, who was this remarkable physicist. Uh, and, and he said the following, and this is a quote from him, when a scientist doesn't know the answer to a problem, he, we might say he or she, is ignorant. When she has a hunch as to what's going on, she is uncertain. And when she is pretty darn sure of what the result is going to be, she is still in some doubt. Scientific knowledge is a body of statements of varying degrees of certainty, some most unsure, some nearly sure, but none absolutely certain. So here you have the lead, one of the leading scientists of the last generation, of the last century, who's saying, look, scientists don't claim absolute truth. There's only, in my mind, there's only one discipline that, that has absolute truth behind it, and that's mathematics. Two and two is four, it, it is mathematically true at all times and in all places. Uh, and mathematical proofs, that, and the reason I love reading about them, even though I, I claim no mathematical knowledge whatsoever, it's just they're so... It, the search for mathematical truth is a search for absolute truth. Anything below that, you know, is up for grabs. But it is absolutely not the case that scientists believe that they have found the answer. Quite the opposite. Uh, you know, I do clinical research every day. And, and, you know, I don't think I've ever really read a study that hasn't ended with the words, although these results are in, further, further study is required, further questions have been raised. This is true in the natural world. This is true in the scientific world. Um, and to claim that scientists shouldn't be believed because they change every five minutes is, is, is quite inaccurate. I'll give you just one more example, if I can. I remember years and years ago, my daughter, uh, who was then an eighth grader, came back with a slide from her Jewish day school in which the, the, the assignment was, what, do, what did people think stuff is made of? And the slide shows that there was Democritus in the you know, in, in the fourth century BC, who believed it was made of little stuff. And then Aristotle believed it was all made of either earth and fire and water and air. And then J.J. Thompson in the 1940s gives us what's called the plum pudding model uh, and so on until we get up to Niels Bohr and the planetary model of the atom and then the electric cloud model of the atom. Now, my daughter was in eighth grade. She did not once, when we were talking about this in depth, she did not once say to me, you know, dad, these scientists, they just can't agree on anything. So I don't believe that science is true. She, at the, at the tender age of an eighth grader, understood that science evolves, that opinions, uh, that beliefs are, are sharpened by new evidence. And when the evidence comes in, we, we understand more. I'll give you another example. The statement that the earth is flat and the statement that the Earth is round are both incorrect. Those are two incorrect statements. The Earth is what's called a, an obligate spheroid, meaning it's like a like a baseball, like a beach ball, but it's squished at the top and the bottom. So it's not flat and it's not round. It's an obligate spheroid. But the description of the Earth as being round is much closer to the truth than the description that the Earth is flat. So it's not in any way reasonable to say that just because a scientific theory is wrong, it's, it's wrong to the same degree as everything else. We have much to learn about the universe, uh, and um, that's what science is going to help us do. But it is absolutely incorrect that scientists themselves believe that new theories overthrow the old ones and everything is a mockery. And that there, are, there are endless examples of, of rabbis of the past, including the Maharal, 
Pinchas Hulwit, Ruvin Lando, the Benish Chai, famous uh, Posek from uh, 1903. Rav Cook writes that, that theories come and go, and soon people will mock these theories. Only the word of God lasts forever. There's Rabbi Moshe Meiselman in our day, who's written some uh, appallingly um, unsophisticated views of, of what science is, Shimshon Rafael Hirsch, and so on and so on. The point of the matter is, it is a very unsophisticated view of what science is to suggest that everything is overturned, so what's the point? And I think rabbis and teachers who step into this area do themselves and do Judaism an immense disservice. If you're going to talk about this, then talk about it from a position of deep knowledge, not a position of what you think might be true, because, not because I say so, but because your students are going to find out the truth. Your students are going to go on to read. Your students are going to go on to see that scientists don't mock the previous scientists and say, oh, all scientific is going to be overthrown. That's not how it works. Students are clever, and we deserve better teaching for our students, both in day schools and in higher education, so that they can understand that when they that there is a scientific theory, we don't simply throw it out and say, well, science always changes, so what's the point? We are more sophisticated than that. So, so yes, uh, 100%. What would you characterize the sort of state, as it were, of the Copernican theory nowadays? Well, it's as close to subtle as you can get. I think any PhD student who says, you know, I'm going to do a PhD in astronomy and I want to find out if the sun around revolves around the earth or the earth revolves around the sun, I think that PhD student would not find a, an astronomy department in the world that would, that would take them. Now, there was a great deal of excitement in the world of astronomy, and this is something that I happen to follow as, a, as an amateur, when things called exoplanets were discovered. Uh, these exoplanets are planets that are revolving around other stars. They, they, we had not discovered them, and then all of a sudden, a, a single exoplanet was discovered, and it made front-page head news headlines. We have evidence that stars have planets revolving around them, just like our star, the sun, has planets are revolving around it like the Earth. And of course, the implication is, if stars have planets revolving around them, then perhaps one of those planets somewhere has an Earth on it, or the conditions that can support life and so on. We have now discovered literally thousands of exoplanets. It's not, it's not news anymore. But the very fact that the first one was discovered set off this, 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 this wonderful sort of spark of interest in people. They said, wow, maybe there really are other Earths. We've known about it theoretically. Now we know about that they actually can exist. These planets that orbit other stars can exist. This means not only that there might be other Earths, but that the Copernican model is true everywhere, that there are lots of stars with lots of planets revolving around them, just like we have in our solar system. One of the challenges is to keep humanity front and center of importance, because the truth of the matter is that we are on a fairly nondescript planet in a fairly small part, you know, a galaxy that's one of hundreds of millions. We can feel very insignificant. And um, I understand why the idea that we might just be like other parts in the universe is very threatening to people. But um, this is the evidence that we have. And I think this is what makes our uh, job on this earth, on the few years that we have as people, uh, even more pressing to find meaning and to explore it uh, and not to take what we have for granted. Right. Yes, this is, um, there's a famous line by, I can't remember which philosopher said this, but there are three sort of major intellectual revolutions in the history of mankind. The first was Copernicus that knocked humanity off of its perch in the center of the universe. And the second was uh, Darwin, which knocked humanity off the uh, off its perch at the pinnacle of nature. And the third was uh, Freud, who knocked uh, humanity off the perch of being the master in his own house, in his own mind. Um, and, you know, obviously this is a broad generalization, but um, but, but yes, you're correct in stating that the, the threat uh, seen by the Copernican model, quite apart from contravening biblical uh, and, you know, uh, rabbinic data, and quite apart from, you know, all the other problems, you know, it's very possible to posit that a large part of the... Um, of the opposition, certainly, you know, in the Catholic world, but also in the Jewish world, is this 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 threat to the centrality of the earth and and of human beings at the pinnacle of the nature. If we are, you know, sort of some sort of unimportant planet in some sort of unimportant uh, galaxy, then um, 
that makes the case for treating us as a special uh, you know, a special case, somewhat difficult. Yeah, the uncentering of the universe. I look, I was just in Krakow a few months ago at a conference put on by the Pontifical University of John Paul II in Krakow, which was uh, titled Fides et Ratio, uh, Belief and Science. Uh, and they invited me to this conference as the guy who knows about the Jewish response to, of Copernicus. Here I was sitting with, and it was remarkable, but I was sitting with uh, three gentlemen all of whom were wearing clerical collars, and all of whom had two PhDs, one in Bible or the theology, and the second, one of them had in quantum physics, one in another kind of physics. Um, and to speak to these uh, deep believers in, in, in their own religion, and yet here they were with literally PhDs in quantum physics, um, showed just how beautifully science and religion can walk together uh, if not hand in the hand, then certainly side by side. Interesting, uh, and and this this neatly brings me to the final point that I I want to raise, and then see if you know your reaction to it, uh, which is that having read your book, uh, the following conclusion presented itself at least to me, which is that we are very fortunate that that the Jewish authorities, you know, the, the major leaders of the Jewish religion, did not go down the same route as the Catholic Church, because what the Catholic Church did was it made it a matter of doctrine of official church doctrine, because it has a pope, because it has a very centralized authority, a matter of official doctrine to reject Copernicus, reject Galileo, and reject the, the, the heliocentric model all the way down to the mid-20th century. Right? And this was official church doctrine, which of course makes life very difficult for any believing Catholic, let's say in the 19th or early 20th century, as more and more evidence piles up that their central doctrines are untrue. And it seems to me that the, one of the things that your book demonstrates is that the sheer heterogeneity of Jewish thought, meaning the, the diversity of opinions within this Jewish intellectual history, at least create space for scientifically literate Jews to maintain both their faith and their and the scientific um worldview at the same time. Uh, and again, it's like it, it's it's precisely the the lack of central authority and the capability of different rabbinic and, and philosophical uh, uh, in Jewish intellectual authorities in different parts of the world to express different opinions on this matter that sort of saved it for the Jews that allowed us not to go down the, the route of the Catholic Church in an overwhelming denunciation of Copernicus, which eventually saved our credibility, as it were. I think it's true, but there also, again, depends on where you were, who your rabbi was, you know, where you lived. As, as, as I say, that, that this was uh, in the conclusion of the book, I, I, I point out that, you know, the, the reaction to Copernicus was a local reaction, which is what you're saying, JJ, that it depended where you were. And there was a, a broad spectrum of beliefs from which you could choose. And it's not like it was in the church where there is there is one organization uh, one leader uh, telling you what you must believe. And so I think this was indeed a strength of ours. Um, some might see it as a weakness that we don't have a central authority anymore. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we, we encourage uh, rabbis to, uh, you know, to, to make their own halachic decisions based on the reality of their communities. And I think the same uh, surely must be true of, of, of how we think about things. That for certain communities, for certain fundamental Jewish communities, fundamentalist Jewish communities, the Copernican model is not right for them. It's too right. threatening. And their rabbis would be right in rejecting it for their group because they know who they're dealing with. Uh, and, for, and for other sections of, of the Jewish community, I would argue for the overwhelming majority of Jewish community, uh, the approach is quite different. So, yes, we, we didn't go down quite the same path as... Um, as Copernic uh, as as the Pope did, although we must remember we have excommunicated people, we ex the, the Amsterdam community excommunicated Spinoza. We're not innocent of this charge. It's not, it's not as we tolerate everything. Yes, we're not. We're not totally. We're not totally innocent of this, and the amount of of of, of invective and you know up the word apicorus, you're a non-believer that's thrown around is quite. Um, most of it, I think, comes from the more religiously fundamentalist. Uh, but they have a different worldview, I think, to you and me, JJ, and probably to most of the listeners here. Our worldview is not one of a, a fundamentalist. Uh, it's one in which the world is not black and white. It's much more complicated and much more beautiful than that. Uh, and if we paint the world in yes, no, black, white, uh, we'll see it that way, but we'll miss out on the remarkable spectrum of, of truths and colors that are, that are part of that world. So Baruch Hashem, thankfully, we don't have a single figurehead uh, and that we we are indeed able to have this magnificent spectrum of views about so many different things, all of which, in some weird way, are ultimately based in the Jewish tradition. 
Well, this has been a wonderful uh, and enlightening conversation. And uh, I'm sorry that we have to draw it to a close. Uh, but I look forward, hopefully, at some point to having you back and to continuing a conversation on this or many of the other topics that you've written uh, so wonderfully about. Dr. Jeremy Brown, thank you so very much for coming on the podcast of Jewish Ideas. We are very grateful and uh, we hope to see you again in the future. Thank you, JJ. It's been a real thrill to talk to you. This has been the podcast of Jewish Ideas by Torah in Motion, produced by Alicia Kelman and myself, JJ Kimchi, edited and mixed by Alicia Kelman. You can stay up to date by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. To support more thoughtful Jewish content like this, please visit torahinmotion.org slash donate.